so welcome back to This Week in Video Games, and I'm here with John Ingold, Narrative Director from Inkle Studios. Welcome, John. How's it going? Hi. Yeah, good. Thank you. Launch weeks are always a bit crazy, but um, yeah, we're doing all right. We're enjoying ourselves. So you launched Pendragon Tuesday this week. How's, how's it been so far? Good. It's actually been remarkable because this is the first time we've launched a game when we've had enough time to test it. I don't really know how that happened exactly. I think it was because it was such a complicated procedural dynamic game that we knew we needed to test it like like we've never tested anything before. So we gave ourselves much, 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 much more time for that than we ever have. And then at some point it was kind of done. So for like the last week and a half, we've been kind of just waiting around for the thing to come out. So it's been quite relaxed, actually. Normally, when we launch things, then, you know, you've had 100 people play it and suddenly 1,000 people play it and all the things that could possibly go wrong start to go wrong and they all go wrong at once. And then you're kind of up till three in the morning desperately fixing things while people are writing you emails complaining about them. And it hasn't really been like that. So actually, it's been quite nice. <laughs> I feel like maybe we've done our job properly for once or something like that. I'm glad I'm glad it's been or it sounds like it's been um, a much smoother experience um, and for those who kind of don't know about Pendragon um, could you tell us a bit more about the game? Sure so Pendragon is what we call a narrative strategy game so it's a turn-based tactics game that plays a little bit like chess it's more like chess than an RPG or a JRPG or anything like that um, only it has a, a narrative twist which is that every piece on the board is a person, is a character. And as you move around the board, they talk to each other and they talk based on what's going on in the level around them. So they talk based on what the enemies are doing, what they're doing, whether they've saved someone, whether they've been attacked. When they die, they get sad about it. Sometimes they argue. Um, and the story of the game is built up from every step that you take across all the boards that you explore in the course of an adventure. So just like that means some really basic things, but some really significant things like any character can die at any time in the story and the story will cope and continue. If you lose your leader, then the followers will mourn their death. Um, perhaps they'll try to seek revenge. Perhaps they'll be so upset that they'll be broken hearted. And as things happen in the story, your characters unlock new abilities connected to the events that have happened. So the narrative and the tactics don't happen side by side. There's no cutscenes. Everything is happening at the same time. And everything that you do is part of the story. And the story is made up of the things that you do. That's kind of, um, that's kind of the Inkle thing. Like We think of Inkle games as games where the player is doing what the characters are doing. And the characters are doing what the player is doing. And there's no separation between the two. And we've always tried to do that in 80 Days, in Heaven's Vault, in Sorcery. And yeah, we weren't sure if we could pull it off in a game like this. Because it really is. It, it really is a bit like chess. I mean, it's quite a simple version of chess. It's quite streamlined. But if you think about all the things that can happen in a game of chess, trying to make sure the story can deal with any of that. Uh, yeah, it was pretty it was pretty tough, but it it works. <laughs> People are out there enjoying it now. So somehow we got to the other end of it, which is nice. Um, yeah, so that's what it is. Oh, I haven't even mentioned the setting. It's Arthurian Nights. It's the fall of King Arthur. Um, yeah, that's what it is. And uh, so I, I I played through eighty days. We we actually talked about eighty days nearly about uh, uh, almost a, a year ago uh, on the podcast uh, when it released yeah. on Nintendo Switch. And, yes, I remember. Uh, played um, Heaven's Vault as well. But Tactics seems a bit of a departure for or or something something new and uh, innovative for Inca. How did the how did the kind of tactics element come about? Well, it started actually with a hobby project. So one of our developers, Tom Kale, who's a designer developer, was working hard on Heaven's Vault two, three years ago, I guess. And in his spare time was messing around with designing a tactics game. And he had this idea of making a game that was elegant and streamlined, that had very few rules, but where you could read the board just by reading it. That was the idea. It was no randomness, no numbers, no calculations, no adding up defensive attack points. Just you look at the situation on the board and you take your decision. So it plays almost like a puzzle, but it's it's a tactics combat game. And designing a game like that is really hard and it took a long time. And we tried out lots of different rule sets and sometimes they were too complicated and sometimes the first player always won and sometimes they nobody could ever win at all and all that sort of thing until we ended up with this game we really liked. 
but we have the same thought that you know you're suggesting it's kind of well inkle doesn't make tactics games so nice prototype but what are we going to do with it but then we asked ourselves a question which was well why doesn't inkle make tactics games if we've got a good tactics game what's the problem oh okay the problem is it hasn't got a narrative and we do narrative well how do you make a tactics game tell its story on the battlefield and when we had that idea we weren't really sure if we were going to be able to do it but we thought it sounded like a pretty awesome thing to try to do so then we started prototyping pendragon and i think it took us about three times to get it right actually we, we had a couple of prototypes that sort of almost worked and then this last one that we started last june maybe it just everything was in the right place the game felt right the balance was right the way the characters talked to each other was right and so we started we started not quite sure if it was going to really work and if it was going to gel and then the more that we worked on it the more excited we got about it and now when you play it what i love about it now is that it looks quite seamless actually like of course there's narrative while the characters are moving around the board why wouldn't they why wouldn't they talk to each other it doesn't make sense that they wouldn't talk to each other of course they're saying sensible things and i think there's you know you've done something right when you play it and you think yeah of course it works like that i mean how could it possibly work any other way and you think well actually i'm not sure anyone's made a tactics game quite like this before really but <laughs> uh yeah so that was how it ended up so it's been quite a learning curve for all of us and i think we've ended up with a tactics game with quite different rules from a lot of tactics games which i know some players find that a little bit confusing because they expect one kind of game and then they get something a little bit different but uh yeah, I really like it. It's a lot of fun to play. It always does interesting stuff. And kind of it has, because we had to deal with all the ways the game could go, we ended up like randomizing most of the boards and the way that the, the map unlocks and all the story unlocks, because the story has to be able to deal with anything happening at any time. So we might as well make the game different every time you play, because that's actually not any extra work. So <laughs> we did that as well. So you end up with this infinitely replayable roguelike narrative tactics game it's just all the words really all the words <laughs> and you've you've got an unlockable kind of series of characters as well so we've got guinevere and sir lancelot available to players when they kind of first start out but as you kind of investigate different areas of the map you can you can kind of you meet up with other characters and they become unlockable i thought that was really nice and uh, it, it makes i got my first playthrough was actually very quick and then my second playthrough took much, much longer. Um, and uh, how do you go about kind of adding in those little um, game mechanics to get people to want to come back and kind of play through again? I think, I think one of the interesting things about the game is that, you know, sometimes you have levels that are ruthlessly hard and sometimes you have levels that are quite straightforward and you can pick your way across and most of them sit in the middle. But every level is a little bit different. Like I keep saying it's like chess, but it isn't like chess, because when you start chess, the board is always the same. You know, the, the opening moves of a chess game are always the same. It takes a while until you get to an interesting situation. I'm pretty bad at chess, so I don't really know what I'm talking about. But I kind of have that, that memory of playing it, whereas Pendragon's got quite a small board, it's got quite a few pieces, but they're all super powerful. So if you change one square, if you take one square off the board and replace it with a rock or replace it with a hummock that lets you go in any direction or, or, or something like that, it completely changes the way the level plays out. If you change one enemy piece from a human to a wolf, they have slightly different AI. And again, it changes the way that the level plays out. So every level is just a little bit different. And every time you play a new level, it's a challenge you've never actually done or seen before. And I think when, when we found that, when we started, after we built the original prototype, we, we started to find little details we could add. And every detail made a huge difference to the way the game felt, the way the level felt. And that, I think, is probably the secret behind it. You, you kind of want to see what the next level is going to be like, because none of the levels are ever the same. Um, but I really like the unlockable. You mentioned the unlockable characters. That's really fun, because... Yeah, well, some of them are quite hard to unlock. But if you have a character who's hard to unlock, they can also be ridiculously overpowered. So after you've struggled through with Lancelot playing kind of a very strategic game, then you can unlock the archer who has a bow and arrow. And obviously a bow and arrow is really useful, actually, in a tactics <laughs> game. So you can play a nice sort of uh, a playthrough where you can really just leather everybody from a distance. And then if that gets too easy, fine. Next game, you don't play with the archer. You go back to playing with someone else. Um, my favorite is Sir Gawain, who's like a drunk. And he's, his starting special move is a kind of 
in, inside the code base, it's called a Highland Fling, which is not what a Highland Fling is, but basically he <laughs> grabs people and throws them over his shoulder. And it just completely messes up the enemy strategy so construction. So he's tearing about the place, just chucking people around the board. <laughs> it's just a lot of fun. And it's very characterful. Um, and you have to figure out how to use it. So there's kind of strategy there too. And as you, um, as you kind of play through, um, you can actually unlock um, kind of new powers and new abilities. The way that the pieces kind of move around the board, for example, you can kind of um, run uh, two players through who are kind of uh, right next to each other, or you can kind of jump right to the other side of the board. Um, how, how did you kind of, or do you have any kind of favorite mechanics uh, like that? I guess you've got to be careful not to make it too overpowered, um, but also, uh, yeah, not, not make it too easy too. Well, like when we started designing them, we were really worried about, about the overpowered problem, actually. We were really cautious about what we introduced because we found that every time we tweaked a rule even a tiny bit, it would have a huge effect on the way the game played out. And then after a while, partly, partly we linked the abilities to a resource, to this resolve point system that you collect up off the board. So that gave us a natural way to pace out the special moves so you couldn't just completely use them all the time. You know, I mentioned the archer and her bow shot, but actually it's rare to be able to do more than two shots in a level, maybe three because of the cost of each shot. So fine, that works nicely. But then the other thing we discovered was that actually overpowered moves are really fun. They just need to be expensive. So towards the end of development, we started letting all the crazy ideas that we'd written down and said, no, we, we can't possibly include that. That's too silly. And we put them in the game. We just make them cost a lot. So Morgana Le Fay, who's like a witch, uh, can pick up the ability to turn her opponents into a bush. And it's really expensive, so you don't get to do it very much. But it's, it's really fun. And so, you know, you get to the end of the game and there's this final one-on-one -on -one duel against the evil Sir Mordred, who's quite... If you happen to be playing a small Guana Le Fay, you can just turn him into a bush. And it's a good ending to the game. And, you know, if you want to play a proper ending to the game, that's fine. You just do it with a different character. And I kind of love the, the structure of the game, the replayability of the game, means that we can afford to mess about with it sometimes. So it doesn't have to be totally serious. Like, you can have, you can have run-throughs, which are all about the tactics and all about the strategy. And then you can have run-throughs, which are just about turning everybody into bushes and having a good time and seeing what goes wrong. And the game can support both of those because it's, you know, we finish your run, you start another one, you do it a different way. I kind of love that in the design. I think that's really, really nice. It's, there's some really touching moments there as well. Um, you've got um, the narrative choices that you can make throughout the game um, sort of all lead up to that kind of final showdown. I, I had a, a Guinevere playthrough and we got, got to the final showdown and uh, uh, I'm I unfortunately sacrificed Guinevere <laughs> for for King Arthur, but it, I was really I was really touched in that moment. It was yeah. it was a, it was a really sad moment, but there's also moments that are really funny as well, and it it really sort of um, pulls on the heartstrings one minute, but also um, you know really made me laugh the next. So I think yeah I think you've you've got an absolutely fantastic balance of um, sort of drawing out the emotion of the of the player. Um, That's really here I, I i think one thing i really feel is that like tactics games and chess games have this reputation of being stone cold macho you know really tough logical things and like it's nice to mix that up with a bit more of the kind of well we're all human actually like if you imagine chess as real people like it's pretty damn dark actually <laughs> like everyone's just charging to their death and they're getting <laughs> mowed down by bishops i mean it's you know it's a bad place to be so it's nice if the game can bring a little bit of that kind of gravitas but also humor into into the game i think that's fun how how did you come about with the kind of uh, arthurian kind of theme of the game was it from originally sort of having a think about chess and kings and queens and um going into that or was it was it something different so i'm a massive arthurian nerd actually and i always have been like my my favorite book when i was a kid was the uh, the once and future king by th white which is a fantastic arthurian retelling it's sort of historical but not too historical and it's really emotional and really soulful and it's just brilliant and so i've always wanted to make an arthur game but i've never really known what to do with it because 
like you could make a kind of 80 days going on a quest for the holy grail but you know, it feels a bit silly and a bit fly away and you know what sort of choices would you be making as these knights roaming around britain and I, it never really landed for me so we were playing this tactics game and thinking about whether we could give it a narrative and I, I guess the idea of doing an Arthurian story popped into my head quite early on just because it's something that I was interested in anyway. So, you know, I started calling the pieces on the board Lancelot and Arthur and Guinevere, but they were just pieces on a board at that point. We weren't even, we hadn't gone very far down the narrative angle. But I think what really fixed it for me was actually when I worked out which bit of the Arthurian story I wanted to, I wanted it to be, because it's a replayable game. And it's a game where you travel across the country to get to a goal. And none of that really fits the Arthurian legend at all until I realized this, this moment at the end of the, the reign of King Arthur when everything's going wrong. And there's this final battle at Camlan where he's going to face Mordred and it's not going to go well. And Camelot has already fallen. And I realized that was just a great setting because it made total sense with our mechanics. It had this sense of one last desperate push, like the one last fight where everything is on the line. So it's okay to have your heroes throw themselves like to their death. It's okay to sacrifice Guinevere in a run through. If you did that in the middle of the Arthurian legends, it would make no sense at all. But if you do it at the end, yeah, Guinevere can absolutely get sacrificed to save King Arthur for five minutes more. That makes perfect narrative sense. And that was a real unlock for me. And I think the other thing that got me really interested in it was actually just the resonance for me, which the Arthurian legend has always had which is the, the kind of political side of it that, you know, Arthur represents the idea, this myth of Arthur and the round table, which we have totally got in the British consciousness all the time. We think of ourselves as good and honorable and noble people. And it goes back to this, this legend of the round table. And that's what, that's what government should be like, right? It should be just and open and ruled by a consensus of opinion. And the, the people in power should be kind and noble and honorable and right now, when you look at the people who are in charge here in the UK, or you look at the people who are in charge in the US, they couldn't really be further from the dream of King Arthur in the round table. They couldn't really be more cruel or more selfish or care less about the people who they're supposed to care for. And that sense of you know, this dream of King Arthur in his round table, which is destroyed by his miserable little son, Mordred, who doesn't have who doesn't want anything apart from the name of king just felt like it was so applicable to what we see around us every day at the moment in 2020 mm -hmm. um that that resonance made me think actually you know what not only is this a story that i think we can tell with this game this is a story that i want to tell with this game right now like this is a story i want to be i want to be working on and and it comes through in a lot of what the characters say that you know they know that they know that the kingdom is doomed. They know that Camelot has fallen. They know that it's too late to save the day, but they're going to try anyway. And I feel like that resonates with, with me and with a lot of people that I know in this hellscape of a year that doesn't seem to be getting any better anytime soon. So, yeah, for me, it was that. It was kind of going back to what Arthur means to me isn't like heroic knights and fun battles and saving dragons from princesses or princesses from dragons rather it's um it's that idea that you can try to be noble and just and honest even if the world doesn't seem to want that and that yeah as soon as i had that idea i realized that this is what we this is what we had to do and i kind of sold it to the team and they were like wow that sounds really great and i think we i think we landed that as well which is really satisfying uh, it's it's absolutely it's absolutely fantastic the the combination of mechanics and story. Uh, I I particularly like the um, kind of campfire stories when you, you sometimes you have to kind of stop off and have a rest. What one of the mechanics in the game you have to kind of gather rations. But the character, like you say, the the pieces talk to each after a battle. They might be a little bit tired. You might have to rest up for the night. And one one of my one of my favourite stories was um, Guinevere talking to another member of the party and she was um, talking about how her, um, how she, she was lying to a little friend of hers by saying, I think they were going hunting for a unicorn and she was kind of lying to yep. this other little girl and um, she said, right, we're going to go off into this field and look for this unicorn. But um, her father uh, came out and kind of discovered that this all this lying was going on and had uh, a ward um, come and punish Guinevere and I think she um, they crumpled 
she was forced to crumple up a piece of paper. Yeah, and, then... and I'm going to I'm going to stop you there because I love that story too, and it's got a <laughs> wonderful ending. So I think we shouldn't tell people on the podcast what is written on the piece of paper, what the, what the special thing about that piece of paper is. But I remember the story well. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, I think the campfire tales was I. I'm really, really, and thank you for mentioning that because actually a lot of reviewers haven't really talked about it. I guess there's just a lot of things in Pendragon to talk about. But like, um, we originally had that idea of characters sitting at the campfire and telling stories to each other. And I wrote one of the stories and I thought, okay, I'll come back and write some more later when I feel inspired. And then lockdown happened, right? Um, COVID happened and we were all stuck inside our houses and there were people just sitting around every day going, well, we don't know what to do and we feel like there's there's nothing going on. And I kind of I remember thinking at the time, I wish there was something I could do to give people something to do just to, to bring people together a little bit. And then I thought, wait, hang on, I've actually got a platform for this. So we we put out a call to writers and we said we, we take submissions for short stories. We gave quite a clear brief of how long they had to be and we'll pay for them and we'll put them in the game. And I didn't really know what was going to happen. I thought maybe we'd get 20. I thought we'd probably just get wall-to-wall -wall porn. I thought I'm basically going to have to just lie and say, write 26 stories and say, look at all these amazing writers. And they're all called John Bingold and Jim Bongold. <laughs> like, just have to just cover for this. And we didn't. We got 500 submissions um, from all over the world, from people of all sorts of ages, and some of them with games experience, and some of them who'd never written stories before. I think our youngest writer was 16, our oldest is over 50. Um, one of them doesn't speak English. He wrote the story using Google Translate. And I had to tidy up the grammar a little bit, but the story itself was really good. And it was an absolute delight it was such a, i mean it was hard work reading through 500 stories and like the bottom 10 percent were pretty awful and the top 10 percent were astonishingly good but in the middle there was some pretty hard decision making about what to include and what not to but it was really wonderful to have that injection of other people's voices and other stories and other ideas into the game and yeah i i i dearly love them when i play the game i love it when the campfire tales come out because it just brings this real humanity to the game and that's the point that's the whole point is like that these people are people and they still care about things and that stories matter and yeah no i'm glad you enjoyed that 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 particular story is one of one of my favorites and i think it's by a i think it's by a first time author actually i think it's he said it was the first story he had ever written it was certainly the first story he'd ever published and we've got a few by writers yeah who it's their first time so is there a chance that maybe um, sort of after launch, you might put some more more of those stories in the game? Or um... I dearly, dearly, dearly want to. Yeah, I haven't announced that we will, um, and I'm not sure that we will. It, it mostly depends on like time and money and budget and that sort of thing. Like uh, there's some effort required to to get them into game and to make sure that they're working and and all of that kind of stuff. But I mean, we've got a pile of at least 300 stories of which I think about half I really like so you know it would be very easy actually to go and get that material and write to people and say hey you know we can we can do an update so I, I would really like to but it, it's difficult because I also really want to open up the field again and say you know you've played Pendragon you see how the campfire tales work now you know are there any new ideas um and I don't know how I would balance those two things because obviously the people who've already written them have written good stuff too but yeah, I would love to turn Pendragon into a short story publishing platform where we're routinely updating it with new tales. That would be really great. But I think we need to achieve slightly, you know, slightly higher player numbers to really justify that. <laughs> mm. <laughs> like, you know, it would be good if we had if we had a few more people playing, then maybe maybe that would be worthwhile. Because there's nothing worse than getting people to write things if they don't get read. That's you know, that's always sad. Well, it's, it's fantastic. I love I love the campfire tale and the story behind it is 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 wonderful as well. Um, one one thing I wanted to ask you about. I saw I saw you put out a tweet recently, and you said, um, "This is one that I never thought we'd finish for technical reasons, mainly that it's mad and it shouldn't work." Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. I wanted to ask you about that and sort of the the technical reasons and uh, yeah, just sort of dig into that a little bit. I thought it was great. Yeah, sure. So um, on the night before launch, I totted up how many systems there are in the game. And I don't mean mechanics. I mean, like, 
AI systems that take decisions about what to what the game should be doing, or heuristic systems that analyze moves and decide what text to run, or text generation systems that work out I don't know the names of locations or what this wolf should say next. And it's something in the order of about twenty six. And they all work together and they do things like they balance the difficulties of the level or they lay out the geography of the level or they work out which special moves you should get next or or whatever, you know, just like right down to the actual AI that plays the actual moves and has to be competent because otherwise there's no challenge for you in the tactics game. And that's a lot of different systems and they all work differently and they're all active all the time and they're all interacting all the time and each one of them has the capacity to bring the game to its knees. Like if the board generator creates a board that's too compact, you can't have a meaningful level on it. If the special move generator picks the same move every time, then you never see the really good ones or you know, if it picks inappropriate ones, you just can't use them and that's no fun either. But then at the heart of it is the system which talks, where the board talks to the story and the story talks to the board. This is kind of a core problem. So on the board, there are some pieces and you and I as humans can look at the board and say, oh yeah, that wolf is being threatening and Guinevere is defending Sakai and Sakai is gonna, you know, he's pretty close to home, so he should be feeling confident right now. But the computer doesn't see that. The computer sees a list of pieces and places and that's all it's got. And so you need some way of analyzing the board, deciding what's important about it, passing that to the text generation engine and saying, right, we think that this is a situation where Kay's feeling good, Gwen's in trouble, the wolf is angry, and then going through some kind of database and saying, what would be an appropriate thing for these people to talk about? And for months and months, we'd have these situations where, you know, so Kay would walk out to the battlefield, a great big wolf would leap right next to him, slavering all over him, and so Kay would turn to Guinevere and say, do you think we've got enough rations to reach Camlan? <laughs> or say, oh, it's raining. And like, you go, no, no, there's a wolf there. You're going to die. Um, or people would sort of, you know, die miserably. And then, you know, Guinevere would be cut down by a bear. And Lancelot would say, oh, I really hope we can get on with this journey. And you'd be like, no, <laughs> that's not an appropriate thing to say after your lover has just been summarily executed before your eyes. Um, and that, you know, for a long time, I thought, well, okay, we have the systems to solve this problem, but can we catch all the cases of it? Can we can we cover the game well enough that it doesn't just say stupid things all the time? And I remember there was definitely a tipping point. It might have been in February or something when I was really starting to get quite scared that we weren't going to be able to do it. When suddenly it was like it, it was like when you're learning a language, you, you learn a language and you learn vocabulary and then suddenly you learn enough words that you can actually kind of say everything that you want to say. And that's a tipping point. Suddenly you can speak French when you couldn't speak French before. I can't speak French, but I, I've seen people who can. Um, and it was like that. The game one minute was this robot just spewing out sentences that were inappropriate all the time. And then we put in enough flags and enough tests that suddenly it was right more often than it was wrong. And it was magic. And it was like oh my God, this thing's alive. And then we were just rapidly hunting down edge cases. And I said, I think at the top of the interview that we, we did a lot of testing and a lot of that testing was people playing it and saying, you know, something incredibly out of context just happened. And we go, oh yeah, I can see it needs to know about this and we need to alter that. Um, and bringing that, bringing that home was terrifying because I, I don't, I really don't think I've ever seen a game attempt what we're attempting in Pendragon. Like, actually like specifically narrating what's happening on the board as it happens with no knowledge about what's going to happen next because that's up to the player um and we really weren't sure that we were going to be able to do a decent job of it and i think i think it's seamless enough that people don't really even realize what it's doing and that's a win um but yeah, I really wasn't. I really wasn't confident. I mean, even on launch, I wasn't confident that we weren't just going to get a thousand emails from people saying, "Here are all the edge cases you didn't find," um, <laughs> which hasn't happened yet. Actually, we've had some bugs, but they've all been, you know, of the nice kind of "I click this button and the game crashes" variety, which are actually really easy to fix. I'm not scared of those things at all. Um, so yeah, no, I I didn't think it was ever going to get finished. And I don't want to work on anything this complicated ever again, but I know we're going to. <laughs> now I just like to write a story. I, I don't know. <laughs> and uh, so talking about testing there, and obviously 2020 is um, a bit of a unique year in most of our lives, uh, probably all of our lives. Um, has has that thrown up some sort of unique challenges for Inkle and um, 
or and how have you kind of got around those challenges yeah i think i think it has though so it's been interesting because we we work remotely anyway we have done for oh about two years now um oh no maybe only a year well anyway we, we've, we've been working remotely for a while and we were working from home before lockdown started though quite often me and tom would would sit in the same coffee shop and work together so in a way it felt like not that much change we were just at home we were working the way that we would normally work we we're communicating over slack and kind of collaboration tools and that kind of thing but i think the one thing that we really missed out on actually was seeing other human beings playing the game because you can send it to testers and you get the feedback and you get the reports but people even the you know only the very 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 best testers will tell you when they don't understand something or when they've got the wrong assumption about something. Because most testers, they find bugs, they report them, they find things that they like, they maybe tell you that. But it's hard for people to stop and say, wait, I don't think I understand this game as well as I should. And I think we we got to release and we, we, did, a, we did a patch yesterday on day one because we saw some feedback uh, via Steam forums and, and on our Discord server from people saying, you know, anecdotal mode, it's supposed to be really easy. And it's a little bit tough. And I kind of played the game again with that feedback in my mind. And I was like, oh, yeah, no, I can totally see now, actually, how this game is. This is being a little bit more unforgiving than it needs to be at this point. And I think if I'd been watching testers in, in real life playing it, if we'd taken it to an event or we've got some beta testers, just or even just played it with each other in a coffee shop, watching each other play, I think we would have seen that straight away. As it was, you know, it's fairly easy to fix that kind of balancing issue because it really is just tweaking some numbers under the hood. You know, I'm much, much happier with the, the build as of yesterday than the build of, as of two days before. But that's a real shame because the game goes out to reviewers and, you know, some reviewers have a hard time with it and some reviewers really kind of get steamed up about it. Um, and 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 I regret that. I regret that. But, but there's only so much you can do. Like, I'm, I've heard of other game studios sort of, getting people to film themselves playing the game and then send that video footage over so they can they can get a bit of that watching someone play it in, in real life but it's really hard to replicate the experience of, of being in a room with someone who's discovering your game for the first time really really hard um so actually really we're quite a small team we're four people i'm incredibly proud of of the way that the team has managed to cope with with the kind of conditions of lockdown and managed to work remotely and like collaborate and you know things like the art style have come together so well i think which is really impressive because you know the three people responsible for the art style is the developer there's the art director and then there's the artist who does the assets you know have never been in the same room on this project i, I don't think at all but like but have managed to get like a really coherent vision that feels really solid and i think i'm you know i'm really proud of them i'm really impressed by that it's kind of it's really nice to be working with people who rise to that kind of challenge so well but yeah, it's it's funny. It's like you almost you almost don't notice that something has changed, and then you look back and you realise, wait, that was a lot harder than it used to be. And I think that's true of a lot of things in lockdown in some ways. And kind of the the current you know the current way of working so remotely is, is you don't really even notice what the hard things are because you're just getting on with it most of the time. But yeah, but when we also missed our launch day celebration, which would have been really nice, <laughs> but like we didn't do that either. I. I, um, so you, you mentioned the art style, uh, and I, I think it's absolutely wonderful. Uh, as as well as so the the visual design and the audio design, as well as the UI, as well the UI communicates a lot, but in a very simple and elegant kind of manner. And I, I particularly like. I noticed one of your artists put out a tweet. I think it was either this morning or yesterday about the sea monsters uh, taking oh, care yeah. of the ships. <laughs> <laughs> but it's it, it's. It's a beautiful. I mean, your all of Inkle's games have a particular style, and they they always look great. But this Pendragon, uh, I think, is is really up there with uh, some of your some of your absolute best work. Um, so, John, how can people uh, get hold of Pendragon if they so they hear this interview and they think, right, that sounds fantastic. How do um how do they get hold of the game? Well, I mean. Hopefully most of your listeners have already heard of Pendragon and played it already. But if there happen to be some who have missed that boat, it's not too late to pick it up, which is the good news. Um, it's available on Steam. Uh, it might be still loitering on the front page at the moment, but otherwise it's Pendragon. You can find it pretty easily. And it's also on GOG if that's your preference. And if you've got a Mac, you can get it from the Mac App Store as well. And it's on a 10% launch discount on Steam and GOG until next Tuesday. I think 
anyway, you should buy it as soon as possible. Uh, and if you do play it and you enjoy it, please leave us a review because we're a tiny studio and people don't leave reviews for tiny studios and they make a huge difference. Um, so I want to encourage, encourage your listeners to leave reviews for indie studios because they need them. Fantastic. And I'll, I'll put a link down in the description and the show notes to the Steam and the GOG page. So if you're out there listening and uh, you want to pick it up, just um, hit that link and you can go straight there. And uh, yeah, as John says, leave a review. It really, really does help out. Uh, well, John, I've taken up plenty of your time today. Thank you so much for coming on the show and talking to us about Pendragon. Um, it's, it's an absolute it's an absolutely wonderful game. I really, really enjoyed myself. The uh, the mechanics are really interesting. The story is absolutely fantastic, and it's all brought together in a in a beautiful, beautiful style. So thank you very much for um, developing a, an absolutely wonderful game. Thank you very much. It's really, really nice to hear that people like it. <laughs> you never know before you release something. You never know if it's going to work. So it's really great. Thank you very much. <laughs>